last week, so I, I, can, I can, that's a rowdy form. Oh, okay, <laughs> cool. I'll keep my eyes on Yeah, I just don't want to get out of hand. Hey, tonight, folks, we're going to talk about the waggle dance and another reason to keep honeybees. The waggle dance, as you all know, is a communication effort that the bees exhibit. Well, our speaker, Danny, let me get this right, now head it. Yes. You guys are really do that with a break or two again. <laughs> Many of teachers have done way worse than that in yeah. life, my life. Uh, Danny is a <laughs> professor, so to speak, uh, Green River Community College. He is a biology teacher, anatomy, what else? Environmental science, yeah. botany, Northwest Ecology. So anyhow, if you will, give him a warm welcome and we'll get started. You can take royal jelly, you can harvest propolis if you want, 
And of course, the beeswax is one of the best candle-making waxes in the world. Yeah? So there's a lot of things that you can actually use from having a bee colony. And there's just all different reasons why to keep bees. But I want to add on to it. They also are food providers, massive food providers, right? So here's just a graph for all the different things that honeybees help us obtain. And this is where the real fear starts coming in if we don't have enough bees, right? We won't have these kinds of things to eat. So we've got to understand that having the bees, getting resources from them, that's really nice, but we also can use them in another way that may be even better long term, okay? So why do I keep honeybees? I keep them for their edu educational value. Very few things are more complex than what you guys have in your boxes. Their social organization is probably the most complex in the world, of all species. They're way more complicated socially, biologically, than humans are. No doubt about it. Their genetics are off the charts. They have some really cool color vision abilities, like everything you do with color vision, They've got it too, plus a little bit more. So from a biological standpoint, from a scientific viewpoint, this creature is just absolutely amazing. I brag that I can take an observation pattern to a kindergarten class and a 900 PhD level course and everything in between and teach from that one little box. Every level of education. Nothing else that I know of can I do that? If I bring a dog, it has a little bit here and there, but not every part of society. Bring in a parrot, eh, not so much. Bring in bacteria, eh, not so much. But the bees are super complex and really powerful as an educational tool. They have also been demonstrated to have the ability to recognize human faces, which the psychologists for a long time said require very specific brain regions of humans. Those brain regions are bigger than the bees. So how are the bees able to do this with such small brains? We don't know. There's a lot of complex details in how the brain works that we still have to unravel. They also demonstrate how to be sustainable in a lot of ways. They air condition themselves and they heat themselves throughout the year. But they don't pollute their environment around them. I think this is a lesson that we can learn from these bees. So, we can use them to educate other people, but we can also learn from the bees directly, based upon their biological structure. So, we need to pay attention to those bees and learn the lessons that they demonstrate every single day of the year. And I think a lot of beekeepers get wrapped up in those other reasons for keeping bees. So, I'm here today to give you just a little bit more, to make you love your bees more completely, be able to see how powerful they really are. Anybody know who this is? Not imprinting. Close. Well, he did do some imprinting. Yeah. This is Carl von Frisch. Yeah. This is the guy who figured out what those waggle dances meant. So there he is staring at bees. And he stared at bees for a very long time. What is he doing? He's watching the bees. How many of you go sit and watch your bees sometimes? Isn't it awesome? Isn't it amazing? He once said, if we use too elaborate an apparatus, nature herself may escape us. And I think a lot of what we're doing in today's world is really interesting and fine and, and lots of technological progress, genetic research, manipulation of genetics, genetically modified organisms. Those are all interesting subjects. But I think sometimes we forget to step back and look at the big picture, to watch the bees, to smell the flowers, right? Now we can get lost in those details. So he, after some 40 something years of research, put out the book that said, this is what the bees do. This is how waggle dances work and a whole suite of other things. If you've gotten a hold of this book before, you know it's kind of hard to read because it's just experiment after experiment after experiment with lots and lots of data and a little bit of commentary here and there. So he sat around and figured that out. So you feed the bees and watch what they do. That's all it takes to understand waggle dances. Okay? There's some bees at an inverted jar on a grooved plate. We also call that a feeder. Okay? Fill it with some sugar water, put it in 
front of the hive, the bees show up. They start drinking. You move it out two feet, they're like, whoa, that's weird. They go out two more feet and get it. And then you move it a little bit more and a little bit more, and you can feed them wherever you want to. They will go and get that sugar as long as it's a good enough concentration. Of course, if you feed them honey, does anybody know how far they'll travel for honey? The world record, they train bees to go get honey? About six miles. About six miles. Roughly 10 kilometers down a straight road for a little itty bitty bee. That's kind of ridiculous. That'd be like you walking to Boise or something and coming back for about this much food relative to your body size. But that's what they do. And then if you start tracking individual bees by painting them, oh my gosh, then you can start to reveal individual tendencies. So, observation, unfortunately, is not enough to figure all the details out, to learn the lessons that the bees can teach us, to teach us about communication, to teach about organization of society. You've got to have a little bit more. So, observation is important, but we need to have an understanding. You have to observe, you have to be curious. Together, and enough motivation, you can get to understanding. It doesn't always lead to that. Okay, and this is important when you come to young individuals in the world. Make sure they have good capabilities of observation. Give them experiences that they can observe the natural world. And your bees are the perfect, perfect tool to put this next generation back into nature and get them out of the virtual reality that they're currently in. And curiosity, when it comes to bees, it's automatic. Automatic. Every single class I've ever been to with an observation hunt, immediately all the kids want to come check it out. Okay, so that part's easy. And then a little bit of guidance to get them to understand how important and how complex these bees are. So, waggle dances. Easiest to observe on swarms. Of course, I know most beekeepers, when they see a swarm, they're not interested in observations. <laughs> At the moment, they're interested in putting a box under the swarm and shaking them into the box, right? But under natural conditions, this is how bees find nest sites. And if some of you have read some of Tom Seeley's work, he talks a lot about this. The bees dance on the outside and say, hey, go check this place out, go check this place out. There's a nest site. It's a communication, right? The other way to observe them is to build observation hives. Do you guys have observation hives? Okay? Just guaranteed hit no matter where you take it. It increases honey cells. Dramatically, you've got it on yourself, okay? Brings people to the table. Curiosity, immediately. So you can do this with observation hives. Here's Tom Seeley. You can go indoors, you can go outdoors. So here's one with uh, the right with the glass uh, tube going out, going out the window so the bees can come in and out. And what a gig, right? Sit there, drink your coffee, <laughs> watch the bees do their thing. If you go in, into Europe, you'll see people that have coffee tables with bees inside of the glass in their coffee tables. It's just a fixture in their house, yeah. It's just pretty amazing. So, videos of wax dances. I've uh, got a video here to show. Waggle, left turns. Waggle, right turn. Now, Aristotle, we have writings from Aristotle describing this dance. And what he said was, well, the bees are dancing, they just spent on food because they're happy. <laughs> now, maybe that's a little bit of personification, putting, you know, human ideas into the bee. And they probably are happy. It's a good thing when you find food. Yeah? But there's more to it. There's a lot more to it. So we want to dig into that today. Attraction to that dance, the fact that the bee still has the pollen baskets full. I mean, is, is there an element of recognition from the other bees that, hey, here's somebody with food in their, in their baskets? Yes and no. So the question is, is there, a, a, is the fact that it still has pollen on his legs part of the attraction? The answer is yes. If they see the pollen, they're like, oh, cool, there's a place I can get pollen. But when they just collect nectar, there's no pollen. But they will also regurgitate the nectar and say, hey, look what I found. But they will also dance to water. So water will be regurgitated. They'll say, okay, this is where we go to get water. When they're on the swarm dancing to potential nest sites, they have nothing to offer. No resources. So in that case, it is
is a purely informational discussion. Okay, so that in that circumstance, the resource, the food aspect would drop out, and it still is able to attract bees. We have built a little robo bee that can sort of dance like that. Accurately enough, as long as you make it spit out sugar a little bit, to make bees go to places. Which is kind of wild if you think about it. I can't say we're fluent in waggle dancing with our robot yet, but it does work. Which is pretty impressive. Okay, so curious, curious. You gotta have to be a curious person. You gotta have curiosity. And for insects in general, most children are like, whoa, there's so many different kinds of bugs. When basically anyone sees a waggle dance, they're just like, what is going on? They're really curious. They want to find out. Make sure we understand, too, what we mean when we say curiosity. By definition, at least one definition, it is the motivation to learn. And as a teacher, man, I wish my students came to class with motivation to learn every single day. Usually they're like, how do I get out of here as soon as possible? Or someone told me I'm going to take this as a credit class and check off a checkbox somewhere, right? I love when I teach continuing education classes because they want to be there. And they're just dripping with curiosity. So, as those children get older, they sometimes lose their curiosity. But what we do on Green River Campus is we show the bees off. And I don't know how many times after showing the bees off, someone leans over and tells me, I'm never going to kill a bee again. <laughs> this is the power of the honeybee. Huh? Unforgettable experiences. I've taken so many people down, shake off a frame with some honey on it, showing the brew pattern on the bottom, the honey across the top, little pollen arch in the middle, and then they taste the honey. They will never, ever forget that in their entire life. And as a teacher, you always look for lessons that never leave the brain, right? This is guaranteed every single time. So, understanding what on earth is going on with these waggle dances. I've been teaching waggle dances for about 12 years now. And about five or six years ago, I developed this interactive program, which I'm so happy about. Of course, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. There are some things that could be fixed, but it does its job. So, if you go to, are we connected to the internet? Yeah. So, if you go to Google and you search waggle, not have, that's my name, and bees, you will get this page. Wait, what, the what dancing you honeybee. What's that? Where, where are we going? Waggle. Waggle, my last name, not have, and bees. Thank you. So, what does a waggle dance look like? Well, we program this little robot bee or whatever, uh, digital bee, to just show you the basics. In science, we talk about breaking down behaviors into their component parts. This is a four-step behavior. Okay? Straight runs and left turns, straight runs, right turns, usually in alternation, not always. Sometimes they go left, 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 right, left, right. Sometimes it's exactly left, right, left, right, left, right. Okay? And if you run through this program enough, it'll explain everything. What are they doing? It's a communication. Yeah? That communication allows them to bring more bees. When a bee comes to a flower patch and says, oh look, there's 50 acres of flowers, there's no way that single bee is going to get all that food. So what do they do? They go back and they dance. And this is what we call recruitment. And in this just little simple picture, if one bee goes back, and recruits four bees. Those four bees come to this place, they check it out. If they feel it's good, they're going to go back and dance. And if each one of those recruits four bees, now all of a sudden, you, know, you have an exponential growth of bees foraging on these flowers. This is what makes them such potent pollinators in agricultural fields. You put them in acres and acres and acres of the same blooms, they will hit every single flower. Because in that box, you don't just have five or six bees like some of the mason bees. You don't just have a hundred or so like some of the bigger bumblebee nests. You've got thousands, tens of thousands of completely addicted worker bees whose only focus is to go get more bees.
resource. At least if they're foragers, right? How many of you have seen Lord of the Rings? There's that creature that needs the ring, right? Smeagol, and just can't live without it. That's every single one of those bees when it comes to flowers. Their level of motivation is higher on average than probably the highest motivational state humans have ever got to. They are so devoted. Yeah? So all of that extra recruitment allows them to get lots of food. If you think about what honey is, nectar from flowers, converted sugars through enzymes, salivary enzymes, and then super concentrated by dehydrating the water off. Okay? Gallons of it sometimes coming from a single hive. That super, concentra super concentrated resource is not easy to get. Most species can barely collect more than their own body weight. These bees are absolutely good when it comes to collecting resource. Okay? And of course, they need this for their strategy of life because they survive and persist when there are no flowers. In the winter, in the cold. And the way they do that is they shiver to keep warm, right? But you can't shiver indefinitely unless you have some food. So the food they consume is the sugars in the honey to continue to power their muscles. And right now in your boxes, the bees are starting to get into that cluster mode, right? Of course, we've had a little bit of warm spell right now. I'm sure you've seen them out and flying. But as soon as that rain comes back, those clouds come back, and the cold comes back a little bit, they're going to tighten up. And they tighten up so that they maximize their heat. Yeah, consumpt or their heat production. Right? If they're all spread out, then they lose too much heat. If they're tight together, then they can conserve a lot of that heat. Okay, so that's the main function of it. Now the details. We know through lots of experimentation, there are at least two primary pieces of information. They communicate the distance from the hive to the place of interest. I say place of interest because it doesn't have to be food. Could be a nest site, could be a water source, could be something else. Okay? They communicate to this place, they communicate this place of interest based upon its distance from the hive and the direction to fly to get there. Okay? So first we'll do distance. It's a little bit easier. The distance is communicated in the waggle component of the four-step behavior. Okay? And here you can see a couple of pictures of bees paying attention to the waggler. And the relationship is relatively simple. If the colony is a square box and you feed them relatively close, you get a waggle dance that's something like this. If you feed them farther away, the waggle dance elongates to indicate fly farther away. There's a couple difficulties in that. There are two ways to dance longer. You can dance longer in space and you can dance longer in time. And they play an interesting little game in terms of sometimes just vibrating more for a longer period of time without extending the actual distance they travel. And sometimes they travel farther but don't do it quite as long. Okay? So it's a little bit trickier. The other thing that's really cool is if you double the distance, it doesn't double the waggle. What this means is it's not a linear relationship between the waggle and the actual distance in reality. It's what's called a logarithmic transformation. And what that means is, for every extra millimeter that they elongate the dance, or every extra millisecond they dance, each consecutive millimeter or millisecond means more and more distance in reality. What that allows them to do is communicate really far distances in a short, small space. The other cool thing, there's so many cool things. One cool, another cool thing about this is they never have to learn how to do it. It's completely built in instinctually. And if you know a little bit about biology, we're literally talking about coded DNA strands making all the pieces and parts of the bees and the cognitive ability to do this. It is in the sequence. It is coded directly in. Have they ever done any research to see if there's a nectar source for a certain distance. If the intensity and the length of the waggle is different on a windy day than on a hot day. Oh yeah, absolutely. These poor bees have been in wind tunnels. They put, they tie lead weights to bees to make <laughs> the drag more, you know, uh, real. So when when they.
they get into a headwind or they have weights attached to them, they advance a greater distance. On the wide so, side, actually, you're going to hit a headwind today. Right? Yes, and exactly how they deal with it in their head, we don't know, but it does take into account some sort of energetic motion. So, how much energy do you need? Something you may know about bees when they go and fly out, especially after following Michael dances, they go take a little bit of honey. And they only fill up as much as they need. Right? Because you don't want to carry extra weight. That's inefficient. So they, they take into account energy. But you can also run a track underneath them so that it looks like the ground's moving faster. And they take into account optic flow as well. How fast the ground moves according to their eyes. So, again, it is very complex. And I wish, I wish it was our technology had progressed enough that, you know, kind of like in the Matrix, I could just download my brain and, you know, plug you in and you had all the knowledge. But that's not the case, okay? And again, that book, that book was written in like 1976, I think. We've learned a lot since then. So that book is just the beginning compared to if you follow through the literature. So. I can pretty much stop here now. Like, you're already mind blown. <laughs> Just get it going. Okay. Direction. The direction is also communicated in the waggle dance by the waggle as well. So nothing is communicated in terms of the primary information in the return paths. Okay? Now, the bees use the sun as a directional reference. There are two problems, big problems, with using the sun as a directional reference. What are they? Watch the sun move. The sun moves and... And sometimes you can't see the sun. But for the bees, that's not a problem. In their brain, they also have an instinctual understanding of the motion of the sun. So, when they get a glimpse of the sun, if the sun disappears for three or four days, in their mind, they already know where it's supposed to be based upon time. It's called a, it's called a time-compensated sun compass. It's built into their brain. They never have to learn how to do this. And because they have that intuitive sense, what you can do is take them from here in Washington, fly them to London, and what's going to happen? There's going to be a time change. What does that really mean in terms of space and our solar system? They just have to reset. They have to reset. What do we call it when we go and do these trips? Jet lag. We get jet lag. Why? Because we expect the sun to be in certain places, and it's not. It sets earlier or arises earlier than we're expecting. They have that same intuitive sense, but I promise you, it is way better than ours. Okay? If you take them from Northern Hemisphere, so here we are in Washington, take them down to Argentina, the apparent motion of the sun across the sky is in the opposite direction. So, they have to figure that out. And in both cases, it takes them about three or four days but they compensate. So whatever machinery they have up there, it's able to deal with constant change. It is constantly updated. It is constantly striving to be most efficient. You know? Wow. But if it's, sunny, or if it's cloudy for six or seven days, they're not perfect. The error starts to accumulate. And the wagon ends to become less and less effective. Which really is not good for the bees in Washington State. Because <laughs> we can get that a lot. Sometimes weeks and weeks at a time. Um, the other thing is they, they don't pay attention to how high the sun is. They pay attention to that horizon. So if you take a, a line and draw straight down from the sun to the horizon, that's called the sun's azimuth. That's what they key in. Okay? So the elevation is not, enough, it's not as important. And then they got to go. So as they're flying, they're keeping track of the sun. And then they got to go and tell their sisters how to get there in total darkness, where they can't see the sun. And they're foraging on like a horizontal field, right? But in total darkness, they're going to be on their cone, which is vertical. So they have to transpose a horizontal plane into a vertical plane. And then look for a secondary reference, because they can't see the sun. So, what is a directional reference in total darkness? Gravity. Pulls you down towards the center of the earth. And this is avalanche training, right? If you get caught in an avalanche and not completely broken, how do you know which way to climb out? Spit. You spit or drop something. It's easy to spit. You got plenty of water in your body. 
And whichever way it goes, you start digging the other way. Right? That'll give you the best chance of survival. The bees have a sense of gravity. Now, you've got gravity, you've got the sun, they have to link the two cognitively. There's no physical manifestation in the hive that's going to represent the sun. So they link the two as follows. The sun, listen carefully, the sun is symbolically referenced as the direction opposite of gravity, which is sort of intuitive, right? Gravity's down, the sun's kind of up, right? It makes sense. But it's an arbitrary thing. It could have been the same direction as the sun. They just do it this way, okay? And once you get that, <coughs> we start to understand how they're able to do this. So, if you've got a colony in the middle, and you feed them in the same direction as the sun, they're going to waggle towards the symbolic sun, which is the direction opposite of gravity, or up. If you feed them 90 degrees clockwise, when they fly out, they're keeping the sun on their left, right? And when they waggle, they're going to waggle so the direction of up, the symbolic sun, is on their left. At exactly the right degree. Now, as you may know, what they're walking on isn't exactly flat ground. It's a hexagon shape of wax. So they can't actually walk straight lines very well. And if you've, if you've seen these bees, they're running into each other. It's just crowded. So they don't exactly run in perfect straight lines. So if bees only watch one waggle, they're going to be confused. In total darkness, walking sideways, following the bees that are dancing, these bees integrate seven to nine dances to get the vector accurate enough to go in the right place. Seven to nine repetitions. Seven to nine repetitions of that. They kind of average it out. In total darkness. They never even see the dances. And that's how we see them with observation hours. Huh? This is just crazy, right? But true. It's so beautiful. Now, I've done that a million times for classes, for beekeeping clubs, until I developed this program. 60% of the people was like, didn't get it. And I do this to my students all the time. And even with this program, like 15 to 20% just don't get it. It is complex enough. Okay? At this basic level, there's a whole bunch of extra stuff too. But I developed this interactive game, I guess you can call it. So, let me back out a little bit. Oh, I guess I want to be back out. That's alright. So, you take the sun, you put it somewhere on the horizon. You take the flowers and put it somewhere in the field. We're going to put it in the same direction as the sun. There's your column. Now, this is a computer. It's just following orders. You can actually put the sun anywhere you want, and it will calculate things. It just doesn't make as much sense. Okay? And then you tell the bee to dance. Does this make sense? Food yes. is in the same direction as the sun, so the waggle is directed in the symbolic sun's direction, which would be the direction opposite of gravity. Right? Now, if we bring the food closer, what's going to happen? The dance, the dance gets shorter, yeah. <laughs> now, you just have to trust me that I programmed this right. <laughs> okay, I could be just totally lying. No? But if you go get a waggle dance and you do this, this is how the bees would dance. So this is like a shortcut, okay? Instead of going out and doing it. But I strongly recommend you go out and do this with little kids. Let them paint the bees. Let them watch them dance. Oh, it's amazing. All right, so now let's move this flower here. Which direction are they going to dance? Think about it. They're going to dance towards the flower. Are you right? Let's make some sense of this. Best way analogy, the best analogy I've come up with is the clock. So here you are in the landscape. The clock, the sun, is noon, it's 12. What time is the flower? 8 uh, o'clock. It's sort of 9, maybe 8.45? 9.45. 9.45. So that when they dance, now, you just put the clock normal. 12 is up. 
you'll notice the wagon dance rotates. And of course, a great scientist would say, oh, it's rotating. How fast? Guess how fast this thing rotates? How many degrees per hour? Follow the sun. Fifteen, you say. <laughs> Fifteen. Why? Because how many degrees are there in a circle? Three hundred sixty. How many hours are there in a day? Twenty-four. When you do the division, guess what you come out to? Fifteen degrees per hour. And I wish I was there with Carl and Fritz the day he did the calculation. Got fifteen degrees per hour. He's a smart person. Said, "Holy smokes, they're using this sun." It gets really, really scary when you ask the bees where the sun is in the middle of the night. <laughs> they seem to understand that it rotates around the planet, or at least apparently as the planet rotates. They seem to get that sort of elliptical understanding. And if you know a little about human history and our explanations of why the sun shows up on one side, goes down on the other side, and the next day shows up on the other side, we didn't figure out that pattern for a very long time. Do they ever confuse like a really bright super moon with the sun? Not exactly. And one of the reasons why is because they use the sun directly, but they also use all parts of the blue sky. So the blue sky, if you know a little bit about polarization, there's a polarization pattern across the entire blue sky. And they have eyes that can detect that. So it's this huge directional thing. That bright lights kind of get in the way and confuse them a little bit. But as long as there's enough blue sky, no problem. If you purposefully take away that blue sky by putting polarizing films to, to block it out and then you shine lights in certain ways, you can get them to, to lose it. Okay. Yeah. Have you ever done any waggle tests, uh, like on the spatial or something with a little Bradley for a second reference? They haven't been able to do that. Um, I, honestly, because resources. Like, there's only so much you can do on a space station. Right. But they've taken these up. To, to get them to fly out and forage it is too much. It's too much. They're not equipped to really do that. They've got other questions they would answer first. And as far as we know, uh, what we've tried is putting them in different cone positions to confuse the direction of gravity, and they still figure it out. Now, the history of different types of honeybees, not just Apis mellifera, the one we have here, there's a bunch of other species, 10 or 15 species, depending on the authority. Some of them don't live in cavities. They actually dance on open comb that's horizontal. And so when they waggle, they're just waggling in the direction you're supposed to go. So the history of how this thing has changed over time is very curious. And the idea is, if some other bees are just watching, they can go get the food, right? If they're just snooping for information. But once you get into a cavity, all that resource is yours. But you have to develop other mechanisms to communicate properly. Does that make sense? So... I strongly recommend you get this, play with it, post the website, show it to the world. I don't know of any other interactive Waggle Dance thing like this. You can find a lot of YouTube videos. But being able to move the things around and try and figure it out on your own, your own way, so powerful. Test grades go way up for my students. And I ask them, the ones that don't do it, you can play with this? No, I didn't have time. Sorry. <laughs> and if you, if you want, there are actual... I, couple of YouTube videos linked there as well. Okay? And then, for my notes, there's mm -hmm. Waggle, and then your last name, and then what? No, I, had a, I just beat. Just beat? Yeah, okay. I think right. that's what I put in. Make sure they're right. Yeah, Waggle, last name, Bees. Bees. You might be able to just put Waggle in my last name. Yeah, Waggle, my last name works. Okay. It's a very unique last name. And Waggle is not something most people type in to the computer. <laughs> I'm taping this for the, for the association. Yeah. Can I put a link? To your site and your absolutely. videos on this? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, and technically, just for verification purposes, I'm here as a state employee, right, from Green River College, so this is all, you know, state stuff. <laughs> and my pay reflects that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I'm one of those rare people that if I had billions of dollars, I would do this. Like, this is not just some thing, this is my goal in life, uh, which scares the hell out of my students, too. <laughs> Yes, it does. Oh, wrong button. Okay? So, you 
can see them, you can be curious about them, and now you have a tool to help people understand what these things are. And again, it's just the beginning. There's so much more depth to this dance. The other major thing, the other reason to keep playing these, other than they're amazing, they've got all this educational potential, they do these black lenses. The other thing is they teach us lessons about sustainability. Lessons that other species just don't get to. The bees are the stewards of the land, at least one of them. They super concentrate floral nutrients. They go all over, miles away, and they bring them into one little spot. They allow us to detect what's out there. People do pollen analysis, right? You can look in the comb for pesticides. They bring all that information to us. And so, as they pull in information from the environment, they super concentrate it for us, we can then analyze the environment with the bees. And ask the question, are the bees struggling? Is there poison in the pollen? Is there poison in the honey? What's happening with the wax? How are the diseases moving around? Right? They sample the environment for us in ways that you're not going to get a human to go to 5,000 flowers anytime soon. Yeah? Well, not in this country. Yeah. So, how can we teach our communities to think about their world? To think about that concept of Mother Nature? And no matter how complex we've ever got, with all of our computers, with all of our amazing technology, there has been zero lines of code that have produced food for us to eat. We are still completely dependent on other life forms. We cannot lose sight of that. Mother Nature, we must take care of it. We can continue to progress in the technological world all we want, but if we lose sight of our food resources, it's all going to be for nothing. What's this? It's a population graph of human growth. A long time ago, across the world, the red line says we were below one billion people. How long did it take to get to the first billion? Well, let's just say we had a few thousand years back there, all the way up till right around here somewhere, 1825, 1830, something like that. First billion. Thousands of years. How long did it take to get the next billion? From here to here. That's a hundred years. This is big time. And then, the next billion, about 50 years. The next billion, about 25 or 30. Each human demands resources from the environment. Sustainable resource management means you take resources at the same rate they are replenished. And across our human societies, we have not obeyed that rule. And what's interesting is, the honeybee is actually a tool we use to pull nutrients out of the ground faster at a greater rate than without it. How many of you know that honeybees are not native to the new world? both North America and South America, yeah? How many of you know most of the crops we grow are not from the New World, North America and South America? And what we've done is we've clear-cut healthy ecosystems that have that balance, right? Resource gathered, resource replenished. And we put down agricultural fields and told the honeybee, make us fruit, make us lots of fruit. So what did the trees do in response? Holy moly, we got all this pollination. Let's pull out more resources out of the ground. And then what happened to the soil? It went down. So what did we do? We fertilized it. Yeah? And then once we did that, we had lots of crops. And then what did the pests do? They said, holy smoke, look at this. Let's get it. And then what did we do? Insecticides. <laughs> this is a problem. If you know anything about soil quality or water quality, in this world, especially in this country, the story is not good in any way, shape, or form if your, your bias is towards sustainability. This is something the bees can teach us. They force us to recognize this. They're the intermediate that's 
getting hurt by the insecticides. And when they get hurt, we suffer <laughs> because they don't give us what we want. But until we start thinking about the bee, until we start thinking about the soil, we're not going to solve the problem. If we still say, we still need all these resources, which come out of the ground faster than they're replenished, we'll continue to be at odds with sustainability. <coughs> and the bars, I should make a small comment about the bars. The bars here represent the total increase per decade. So the increases are increasing. Yeah? And think about this. The increases doubled. And then they doubled again. And they're starting to tell off this is this is projected data. Okay? So we don't know if this is going to be true or not. But they're kind of plateauing. And those extra doublings, these are time periods where the Industrial Revolution is sweeping across the world. Electricity is now available. The nights can be warm, right? That takes energy from the planet. That takes energy from our ecosystems. This is modern medicine's influence, right? Think about when the first vaccines start showing up, and then they start spreading around the world. If you want more humans, they will demand more energy. And the only thing that's going to happen is either we suck the energy out, or we prevent other forms of life from using it. And their populations drop. Those are the things we depend on. You know? Every single breath you take, you should be giving thanks to a plant somewhere that made the oxygen so that you can persist. And how have we treated plants in this world? Not so good. And the hills around us, the mountains I should say around us, are perfect examples of that. Most of the west face of the Cascades is a huge agricultural field. Yes? Trees that have been cut down and are scheduled to be cut down again. But we're not we're not recycling our old growth timber in our national forest like we should. Now they're beginning to rot and put more uh, CO2 in the air Absolutely. instead of oxygen, where if they had been naturally either wildfire burn them down and they come back as young trees, they would soak up more CO2. Absolutely. Put out more oxygen. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the graph across the world. Healthy forest ecosystems, long time ago, just think about 500 years ago, if you combine green and red, that would be the distribution of healthy forest ecosystems. Now, forest ecosystems are more than the trees. That's the first thing you understand. So there are trees there. But those systems are no longer sustainable because of how humans are interacting with them. That's the red part. This graph goes as far as to say 80% is now no longer sustainable. I would say it's more around 60, or sorry, 70%. But either number is pretty alarming. Yeah? Where are they still good to go? Look at Canada. That's where machinery stopped working because of the cold. Now, over in Russia, they apparently don't care about the machinery. They still go with their hand axe. And then way down in the rainforest, where it's just hard to get machinery in in the first place. Yeah. Everywhere else, the impact of humanity has been felt. If we're going to think about sustainability and let the bees guide us in this endeavor, we have to make effective decisions. So, of the options before you, which is most sustainable, or I should say, which demands the least from the environment? Raise your hand if you think it's the SUV. <laughs> Raise your hand if you think it's the sedan. Raise your hand if you think it's the motorcycle. Most fun, too. <laughs> Raise your hand if it's the option of none. None of the above. <clears throat> but we don't even think this way anymore. <clears throat> right? Look at that big, wide open space. That's why I left it big. You can put this in the middle, right? Think about a young kid coming into high school. Got to have a car, right? Got to. Have to continue pollution, right? Have to. Now, there may be hybrid cars. There may be electric cars. None of them are good for the environment. Zero. Some are a little bit better. But all of them pollute. Listen carefully. No one will sell you a car that gives a damn about the environment. Why will they sell you the car? Love it. To make your money. You know, they, it's so hilarious. They put these little fake digital trees and you push the eco button, it grows a tree in the dashboard. <laughs> and 
people buy it because of things like that. When it actually takes more energy to do the tree growing display than if they didn't put it in. It's a technology world, right? We've got to have computers. We've got to learn coding. The way they're pushing coding in this kind of technology on young students today is amazing. Two people in this world are more responsible for this trend than any others. Bill Gates, and who's the one we lost recently? Steve Jobs. No people in the history of humanity have taken more eyes off of nature and put them into a virtual reality. This is a catastrophe. Listen carefully. This next generation is the most disconnected from nature ever in the history of humanity. This is scary. How many of you have heard of Pokemon Go? <laughs> People are willing to find fake, totally created, virtual creatures. But they're not willing to go clean up a park. They're not willing to hand remove pests. They still will use insecticides. This is the world we've created. And it was called progress. It's definitely progressing in some direction, just not towards sustainability. So what's the best option? None. What's this? Socket. It's a 120 out. Young kids growing up in this world, they get taught something about this. What is the first thing they learn about this? Don't put your finger in there. And you can't fit a finger in there, but the idea is don't stick stuff in there, right? Four. Guess what? More humans die to this every year than hundreds. And they're all over the place. We're willing to accept it. What's the second thing they learn about this? Which one they stick in? Which one do you stick in the stuff? And what are they going to stick in? The computer. Huh? The computer. The refrigerator, the microwave. This is how mommy charges her phone. This is how daddy watches TV, right? And it's unending. And it's unending. It's, it's, it's just naturally there. Yeah, and it's everywhere, right? It's compatible unless you travel to different countries. They don't have to buy a converter. It's sort of a pain, but that's kind of a first <coughs> world problem, right? If you have kids, you know they imitate. So who's going to be responsible? for ushering in a more sustainable future. Is it going to be the kids? No. No. We've got to lead by example. We have to. And what's great is the bees help. Well, we just rejected the carbon tax. <laughs> there are many forces at work. What should they be experiencing? They need to take time to smell the roses. They need to take time to watch how food that they are eating is produced. They need to see an unending motivation of duty, no matter how hard it is. That's what the bees demonstrate. You all see it, and you know how beautiful it is when you're sitting there watching your bees. Hey, oh, there goes one the yellow pollen. Oh, there goes one the orange pollen. Which flower did that come from? Think of how powerful this is for a young mind. Those concepts that enter into their brain, they're going to be fighting against the school systems who are going to say, computers, technology, coding, learn how to type, all that stuff. And it's not that there's anything wrong with that. But it's, again, it's a moderation thing, right? If we get so wrapped up in that digital world, is it possible that we can forget some of the most foundational things. How many of you have heard, we've got this energy crisis and solar panels are going to save our lives? <laughs> if you look what happens to the earth underneath a solar panel farm, it is clean sweep of life. The solar panel industry is willing to sacrifice ecosystems for electricity. <laughs> No solar panel would ever produce food. That's not a good exchange. Hmm. Is that
Canada? Uh, this is somewhere in the Pacific. I don't remember where. This is where the Pacific Garbage Patch is. What's important to understand here is the languages on these boxes are not the languages this person speaks. Did you know we export trash to other countries that are poor? We pay them to take the trash. Because we don't want to see it. Out of sight, out of mind, right? What happens when the trash, the trash pickup stops working? It accumulates fast, doesn't it? The point is, it's accumulating fast, no matter if the trucks are running. It's just somewhere else. Do other people deserve to live like this? This is what's happening to the soils when we put fertilizers in. This is what's happening to the rivers when we dump insecticides. We just don't see it with our eyes. <coughs> so, the bees, back to the bees. We have responsibilities. And honestly, as beekeepers, you have this special creature that does so much of what humans do, what humans do without polluting their world. They help plants, they help us get honey, so forth and so on. It's a responsibility. It's a duty. And again, we've got to lead by example. When I was getting my degree in grad school, this was one of the primary things. My whole committee sat down and said, yeah, you're investigating this, this, and this. Danny Norris is in trouble. You have to help it. And so my professor and I, we sat down with a big book of all the species in the world, big old, you know, and kind of went down the list and said, which species is going to be the most efficient at drawing out all these system-oriented issues that are going to make us face the realities that we're putting ourselves in. And we landed on the honeybee. Because in a little box, you can talk about all of these things. You can teach little kids how to do less. You can go to a corporate system and say, they will make you more money if you go sustainable. You can go to the doctorate level and say, I'm going to blow your mind in ways that you can even understand were possible. What's interesting is, as an academic, I have not fallen far from the tree. There I am on my wedding day, my mom's in the background, sitting down with my mentor, Rudolf Yonder. He was one of the last PhD students of Carl von Frisch. So Carl von Frisch is my academic grandfather. Of course, I never met the man, but the waggle dance discoverer, well not discoverer, but the guy who explained it, figured out the scientific this is my legacy. And this is why I said a few minutes ago, this is not some gig for me. This is all I'm going to do for the rest of my life. The world deserves better. And I know we can do more. And just think about it. Every day you make decisions. Are there a few you could do better? Start there. The situation we're in now didn't happen overnight. The solution is not going to be an overnight solution either. And guess what? It doesn't matter what the legal legislation tells you to do. This is above law. You can choose not to use gasoline. You can choose not to use electricity or less. Look at this young man's face. There's part fear, part reverence, and pure amazement. <laughs> and when you take someone to a colony and tell them about these things, like I said before, I don't know how many people have said, I'm never going to kill a bee again. And then they say, that means I probably shouldn't use insecticides. <laughs> this is how the ball starts rolling. Very few species in 10 minutes at a hive or at a dog kennel or at a bird house or whatever will get them from where they are to this moment. These are powerful lessons given by a powerful instructor. Instructors, female instructors, the bees. You don't even have to do anything. The bees will do it for you. They are teachers. They are ecological gatekeepers. They are going to be the flagship organism if we want to get serious about moving away from where our path is now into sustainable systems. 
They are not even native. They force us to think about how we're even approaching this whole idea of food production. What other species can really emphasize that? They favor the plants that are non-native in basis, highest on the noxious weed list in the state of Washington. So what does that mean as a beekeeper? What are you doing to the environment? You have to confront these issues. That's why it's important. It is a double sword, double-edged sword in like 70 different categories. You can fight for it and you can also fight against it. The point is, it makes you think about it. It forces you to, okay? So, what you have in your box, yes, it makes you money, yes, you can get a pollination contract, yes, you can get some wax out of it from time to time, but it is so much more important than you can imagine. It is one of the major keys to our understanding about ecological sustainability. It is the easiest way to move someone from this place where they are now to a place closer to sustainability. You will not find another organism, on average, that does it faster, that does it quicker, and puts a smile on a person's face when they taste the honey. This is the power. This is the reason why I keep honeybees for educational purposes. And if I don't get any honey because I'm in my hives three times a week, then so be it. And guess what? Of all species, I would bet the bees would be willing to sacrifice themselves if they could guarantee that bees have a bright future. They already sacrifice themselves when they sting you. They understand completely altruism. I will die for the high. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And for these Star Trek fans, or the one. Do you have any questions? So it sounds like with the dance that they are they're always communicating positive things. A new home, food source, a water source. <coughs> Do they ever communicate through a dance a negative uh, Yeah, as far as I know, that has never been done. They have the alarm pheromone, which is useful in that, that circumstance. What they have in terms of sort of an inhibitory thing is if a certain bee is dancing and another bee comes back from the place they're dancing to, it's like there's not enough food, they'll ram them with their head to okay. stop them from dancing. It's, it's a headbutt. So then there's some communication back and forth with the dancers. There's some feedback. They go to the dancers, they stop, stop dancing. It's a scam. Yeah, it's bad information. But it's not exactly what you're saying, it's just kind of the, sure. closest, the closest they get. So when you dance, the form of art, how is that information actually received by the bees around them? There, there is a couple things. So they antenate, so they tap the bees with their antenna. They're moving, so they have cues along their body of what, how they're moving. Just like you know if you close your eyes, your elbow's here, right? You get that sense. They have the same ideas. Uh, it's called proprioception, right? And then uh, there's a sound involved, too. There's little beeping noises. So there's verbal and then yes. tactile. Gestural and tactile. Absolutely. Uh, I heard that bees were deaf. Are they they are sort of. And that gets really tricky because the ability to hear sound is a vibratory thing. And if you can feel vibration, does that mean you can hear? It, it's sort of a tricky area. And what we hear, we have vibrations in our ear that get translated into sound. So you don't actually have to have someone speak or make a noise. If you put a little hammer in there and you just vibrate, we will interpret it as sound. So what they have is a vibratory signal. And the peep noises that they make are really narrow, short field kinds of noise. So we don't know if it's exactly hearing or it's just they're so close that it's just vibrating them in the right sort of way. So we know it's a vibration. All noise, all sound is a vibration. When we choose to describe it as a sound instead of just a vibration, that's kind of arbitrary. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the queen yeah. will go peeping around. And so the, that must be something in the vibration that is the depth of the high people that works in these sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And some people have actually argued initially 
that the sound produced is just an extra thing from the vibratory system and that it wasn't necessary at all. And the research, as far as I know, has shown it's not necessary. The vibratory stuff is good enough, but it's better with the noise. <laughs> so it's, the noise is not necessary, but it's sufficient. It has an enhanced arrival signal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They've got all kinds of cool kept up cues in their abilities as well. Do pheromones play any uh, part in this <laughs> The pheromones play a role in terms of attracting attention, but even still, it's kind of minimal. So if you look at a hive, there's actually a dance floor where they do the dances, and there are parts where they go into the dances. So near the entrance is where they do dances. That's sort of just known. There isn't exact pheromone cues on how to set that up. Um, the pheromone cues are due to the excitement of the body, the use of energy. But that also gets picked up in terms of vibration and, and sound. But you also said that they some yeah. Know what yeah, and when they when they do that, um, it isn't their chemicals telling the other bees. So that's why we would say it's not a pheromone. What it is is they say when you get to close to where I told you, search for this, this flavor, this scent, this concentration, and that increases the efficiency of them getting to the exact spot they're supposed to be. But that offering actually isn't necessary. Okay, which is. It's hard to make this happen in an experimental fashion, but we've done it. Does Green River have waggled edge classes that we can send our sponsors to? Not waggled edge classes directly, but uh, some of the Bio 100 classes that I teach, we teach a lab on bees. And if the conditions are right and I got it all set up, we actually have students feed bees in two different places. We have three different uh, groups. Some of them are painting and watching and tracking dances, and others are taking food away or putting it in its pots. And each place is color coded, so they say yellow's dancing this way. They don't know where they are. Each group doesn't know who, who's where. So then they have to calculate it out and put it on the graph. I have a question regarding the the queen's impact on the dance. Does does her pheromone signature and the strength of the queen impact the efficiency or the quality of the dances, or even whether or not they dance at all? Is, that, is, that, is there a genetic component? Yeah, there's absolutely a genetic component, and part of whenever you have a good queen, it doesn't mean she's laying eggs really good all the time. It right. could mean she's got really efficient communication. Right. I mean, how many of you beekeepers track the efficiency of your swaggle dances in your colony? That would be really hard to track. I don't know if it's But, but, but if, if, they are, if they are inherently strong foragers, you could point to a genetic element of absolutely, the queen. Yeah. Whereas uh, an otherwise healthy colony that is that they are lazy foragers, can can you yeah. can you make that extrapolation? As far as I know in the research, they haven't been able to make that. Okay. It, it's totally reasonable considering we know certain genes code for mite destruction, you know. Mm -hmm. But when you go the levels, you know, from molecules to cells to tissues to all the way up to this cognitive stuff, the wacko dance is at like a whole bunch of levels higher. So that difference is, is more massive than it would have seen. So it's less likely for us to detect. Doesn't mean it's not there. But as far as I know, no one has shown that, and I'm pretty sure some people have looked. Well, it, uh, the more and more we come to recognize how much we have fussed around with the genetics and, and yeah. the queens are stupid, um, I wonder whether or not that doesn't have a down the road impact as, as yeah. far as foraging ability. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't doubt it at all. But also you have to remember that they're getting inputs from drones from a lot of different kinds of drones. So the idea is you want lots of drones, females made with you know, 10, 20 sometimes drones. Some of those will make great foragers, some of those will make great wax producers, some of those, and through that variety, that seems to be the most important thing. Um, otherwise, the queens would just select one drone and go with that, right? But there are no honeybees in the world that do that. Now, I will say there's definitely a genetic component in that when they first discovered the wacko dances, Apis mellifera. They said, all right, uh, my professor and another guy by the name of Martin Lindauer, they said, okay, go out to the rest of the species and see what their dances are. And there are dance dialects. So the genetic difference between species shows up as just slight variations in how they communicate. Same as like French and German or French and Spanish. There's, there's fluctuations in it. They're more or less the same, but there's little accents here and there that change. I'm pretty sure they've I'm pretty sure they've shown that there are differences in the subspecies. A 
observable, scientifically verifiable. I don't think they've shown that it alters what happens in terms of food, like the end result of that. So I think when they're doing their averaging, it just kind of cancels out all those minute little changes. So if you get a new queen in your colony, then there's probably some difference, but it probably doesn't show up very effectively down the road. Cool stuff, right? Yes, sir. Probably does, yeah. So the, our waggle dances are probably all very similar, like a lot of the traits for honeybees in America. They're all very similar. There's not a lot of variation. If you guys know a little bit about the work that they're doing at WSU, they've shown very clearly they go out to other parts of the world, especially where the European honeybee exists in Italy and Germany and all these places, and they say, look at all these genetics. And then they compare it to the ones here, and they're like, look at this little bit of genetics. Yeah, so the amount of variation in our country is very narrow extremely narrow. And the amount of variation in small areas in Europe is so much faster. So the genetics are the tools you play with to guide your traits in different ways. And I have to assume it would affect the dances. So they're probably more narrow in our country than anywhere else. The dances are tighter. Less variation between dance to dance from high to high. And so forth and so on. Any other questions, guys? It's been pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Sarah.